Okay, good morning. Um, um, we're resuming um, our meeting and um, we're going to start the meningococcal vaccine section session and I would like to turn things over to Dr. Lair who is chair of the meningococcal vaccines work group. Dr. Lair. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Um, good morning. I'd like to have an introduction to the meningitis vaccines work group, our presentations. Next slide. There are two major topics that we're gonna be going over today. The first, at past ACIP meetings, members asked for a review of the current adolescent schedule for the meningitis vaccines. The work group has had a very robust discussion about the options. We had over 10 options at one point and we've narrowed it down to about four. Um, channeling Dr. Creech from yesterday, I'm gonna do the bottom line up front. What I'd like the ACIP members to think about as we're going through the presentations, does the ACIP concur with the four options that we chose for further assessment? And what additional information would help the ACIP determine the preferred option? The second major topic is much more of an informational topic. As you may recall, we approved the Pfizer pentavalent vaccine in October of 2023. And that was approved as an option when both the men ACWY and the men B are recommended at the same time. We're now using the same framework for the GSK pentavalent vaccine. And we wanted to give you some talk about our planned, our planned considerations. Next slide. So at this meeting, we'll be going over those two topics. At the June 2024 meeting, we'll be reviewing the epidemiology of meningitis disease. We'll go over the disease burden, the causes, cases and deaths averted by the men ACWY vaccine, the risk factors for the zero group B disease, and then also talk about breakthrough disease in vaccinated individuals and we'll talk about our considerations of these and how they're influencing our decisions. Next slide. In October of 2024, we'll present a grade and an ETR analysis and a cost effectiveness analysis, and we hope to plan for a vote in February of 2025. Next slide. These are some of the considerations that we're considering, but it's a non-exhaustive list of things that we're gonna be reviewing as we make recommendations in the future. And the next slide, I'd like to thank the entire work group. I wanna share a lot of appreciation for all the hard work that people are putting into this, and I wanna appreciate their time and effort. Back to you, Dr. Wharton. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Uh, Dr. Shilley, do you want to uh, get us started? Good morning. I will present on revising the adolescent meningococcal vaccine schedule, term of reference and considerations. Next slide. For this presentation, we will review meningococcal vaccine recommendations and coverage data, the epidemiology of meningococcal disease, duration of vaccine-induced protection, and options for changing the immunization schedule. Next slide. Men ACWY vaccine is routinely recommended for adolescents with dose one administered at 11 through 12 years of age and dose two at 16 years of age. Men B vaccine is recommended for adolescents based on shared clinical decision making and is typically a two dose series. The recommended age range is 16 through 23 years with the preferred range of 16 through 18 years. The doses in the MIN-B series need to be from the same manufacturer. The pentavalent MIN-ABCWY vaccine is recommended as an option when both MIN-ACWY and MIN-B are indicated at the same visit. Next slide. The 2022 coverage for at least one dose of MIN-ACWY vaccine was 84.5% for 13-year-olds and 89.8% for 16-year-olds. For 17-year-olds, coverage was 60.8% for at least two doses. As expected, coverage was much lower for men B vaccine, as those recommendations are based on shared clinical decision-making. 
the coverage for 17-year-olds for at least one dose was 29.4%, and for at least two doses was 11.9%. Next slide. This slide depicts the incidence of meningococcal disease in the United States from 1996 through 2022. Note that the incidence started to decline before the introduction of men ACWY vaccine in 2005. There is an uptick in disease incidence in recent years. Next slide. The proportion of disease caused by serogroup varies with age as depicted here for 2020 through 2022 or during the COVID pandemic. Next slide. This slide shows the proportion of disease by serogroup from 2012 through 2021, or predominantly pre-pandemic data. Serogroup B accounted for more than half of cases among adolescents. Note the y-axis scale on this slide differs from the previous slide. Next slide. Preliminary data reveal 416 cases of invasive meningococcal disease in 2023, which is the highest number of cases since 2014. The rates of disease are greatest in children younger than one year of age, and there is a second peak in adolescence. When considering the 2021 cases, for which the most recent data is available, 19 of the 210 cases, or 9%, were among 11 through 23 year olds. Next slide. Because the decline in meningococcal disease incidence began prior to the introduction of vaccine, measuring the association between vaccination and disease incidence is challenging, but has been modeled using surveillance data. Among adolescents 11 through 15 years old, Incidence decreased 16.3% during the pre-vaccine period and 27.8% during the post-primary dose period. And among adolescents 16 through 22 years old, incidence decreased 10.6% during the post-primary dose period and 35.6% during the post-booster dose period. An estimated 222 cases of serogroup C, W, or Y disease has been averted through vaccination of adolescents from 2006 through 2017. Next slide. This slide shows the incidence of disease following men ACWY vaccine implementation. Starting with the graph on the left for serogroups A, C, W, and Y, in the pre-vaccine era, noted by the dark blue line, men A, C, W, Y disease increased around 15 to 16 years of age. And following men A, C, W, Y vaccine implementation, noted by the light blue line, disease decreased dramatically, although there is still a peak at 12 years of age, which could increase if the 11 through 12 year old dose were eliminated. Moving on to the graph on the right, serogroup B disease became the dominant cause of meningococcal disease in adolescents, although incidence has decreased slightly since the pre-vaccine era. Next slide. Serogroup B disease is higher among college students. College students have a 3.5-fold greater risk of serogroup B disease than non-college students and the incidence peaks at 19 years of age and declines after age 20. Next slide. And that higher risk is associated with students at a four-year college as opposed to a two-year college. Additional risk factors include being a first-year student, an on-campus resident, and participation in Greek life. Next slide. And now to discuss duration of vaccine-induced protection. Protection wanes over time following meningitis vaccination. For men ACWY vaccines, protection wanes between three and eight years post-vaccination. Within one year of vaccination, vaccine effectiveness is 79%. Between one and three years post-vaccination, vaccine effectiveness is 69%. And between three and eight years post-vaccination, 
vaccine effectiveness is 61%. For MinV vaccines, protection wanes one to two years following primary vaccination. Next slide. Bexero is recommended for the prevention of serogroup B meningococcal disease and deliberations regarding the adolescent meningococcal vaccine schedule will primarily consider meningococcal disease prevention. Bexero also appears to provide some protection against gonorrhea. Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea are genetically closely related, sharing about 80 to 90% sequence homology. As such, it is plausible for outer membrane vesicle meningitis B vaccines, such as Bexero, to provide cross protection against gonorrhea. Next slide. Revisions to the adolescent meningococcal vaccine schedule should optimize protection against meningitis. Considerations to optimize meningitis protection include ages at higher risk for meningitis, recent epidemiology, and duration of vaccine-induced protection. Next slide. Maintaining harmonization with the existing adolescent platform is an additional consideration, as is the use of pentavalent vaccines, which provide the opportunity to reduce the number of injections. Next slide. There are several options under consideration when revising the adolescent schedule. For men, ACWY, an option is to eliminate the 11 through 12 year old dose or to change the recommended ages for vaccination given the low incidence of disease in young adolescents. For men B, an option is to change the recommended age for vaccination to increase protection upon college entry given the limited duration of protection. Another option for men B is to change the shared clinical decision-making recommendation to either a routine or risk-based recommendation. If there is a change to a risk-based recommendation, the work group expressed a preference to include permissive language for vaccinations of persons requesting protection but who may lack risk factors. This preference is to address equity considerations. For example, such that college attendance would not be a requirement to receive protection from men B vaccination. Next slide. This slide depicts the four options proposed by the work group. The first row, shaded in green, represents the current recommendations. The next four rows represent four proposed options. Note that the numbers one through four do not represent the work group's order of preference, but are assigned for ease of referring to the options. Option one maintains the current min ACWY recommendations and changes min B recommendations to routine recommendations with dose one administered at 16 years and dose two at 17 through 18 years. Option two is similar to option one, except that the recommendations for men B for option two are risk-based as opposed to routine recommendations. Option three is similar to option two, except that option three eliminates the 11 through 12 year old dose of men ACWY. Option four is for dose one of men ACWY at 15 years and dose two of men ACWY at 17 through 18 years and for dose one and two of men B at 17 through 18 years with the routine recommendation. Next slide. The work group preferred option one or three as noted by the red boxes here. Next slide. And the diagonal shading on this slide depict doses of men ACWY recommended at the same age as doses of men B. In other words, instances in which the pentavalent vaccine may be an option. Next slide. In the next two slides, I will summarize the work group's comments. There was variability in the desire to keep versus to eliminate the 11 through 12 year old dose of men ACWY. 
Those favoring keeping it noted that it has taken years to ingrain the 11 through 12 year old platform and that that dose may have reduced carriage and has worked. Those favor eliminating that dose point to the epidemiology, which seems to support starting the series at 16 years of age. Other comments were to consider Min B starting at 15 years of age and to try to achieve acceptable efficacy for duration of disease incidence peak in young adulthood. Next slide. Workgroup members opposed shared clinical decision-making recommendations, citing poor uptake, missed vaccination opportunities, implementation challenges, that a lack of a strong recommendation prevents institutions from implementing policies, and that shared clinical decision-making recommendations were not understandable to clinicians. As such, the work group had interest in changing MinB recommendations to either risk-based or routine. Members noted that harmonization of MinACWY and MinB schedules could reduce the number of injections if using the pentavalent vaccine but also pointed out that if the use of the pentavalent vaccine resulted in extra antigen administration, that extra antigen administration had not been a concern in the past with other vaccines. And members also noted that a change in the schedule may impact school requirements. Next slide. I would now like to open this meeting up for discussion regarding potential changes to the adolescent schedule and would like to ask ACIP if they, confer, if they concur with the four schedule options for further assessment and what additional information will help ACIP determine the preferred option. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shelley, maybe it would be helpful to go back to the slide with the preferred options. Um, yes, or with the that options is that are slide under 26. Or, or, yeah, that one's fine. The next one, the next slide, yeah, that one might be better. So it may be hard to provide an immediate response to this, but um, Dr. Lair? Um, one thing the work group was considering was that harmonization with other organizations is very important. And so I'd like to call on my pediatric and family practice colleagues on the liaisons if they have any comments or if their organizations have any opinions on this. I'd be interested in what they have to say. Uh, Dr. Middleman. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Amy Middleman from the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Um, I really appreciate this discussion. It was very thorough and brought up you know, the majority of issues that we've been discussing at the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Um, one thing, we did have a talk that um, Dr. Shelley so nicely attended as well um, and asked for feedback from the attendees who were adolescent medicine providers. Um, among the um, 25 respondents, and it's not a huge group, but I think there was um, pretty clear concern um, about potentially eliminating the 11 to 12 year um, vaccination for multiple reasons, but I think the health and safety of our adolescents is obviously paramount, but also the integration of that into the um, the platform is, Im is important. Immunization platforms are there to remind people that it's time to think about vaccines and specific vaccines. Um, I think the reason childhood platforms are so successful is they haven't been changed in a long time. And to change the platform would take, I think, significantly more data than we have that would indicate that it would be of benefit to the health of our teens. Um, I think there was also a very strong sense that the use of the pentavalent vaccine, especially if cost savings were associated, would be far preferable in terms of the ability to decrease the number of products that need to be that are required um, for for um, vaccination and uh, potentially, obviously. Um, and I think making the um, shared clinical decision making recommendation for men be um, 
making that routine would make um, administration of all of the, these vaccines um, more streamlined, efficient, and easier to follow. So I think the QPP um, idea was very well received among adolescent medicine providers. Um, about 80% of those responding to a brief survey, again, after the talk, also felt that the pentavalent um, given at 16 with a second dose, either at 16, 17 to 18, or, or anywhere between 16 to 18 would be ideal. So I know that's a lot of information in one comment, but I appreciate you all letting me speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rockwell. Hi, uh, thank you. Yes, I agree with everything Amy, Dr. Middleman said. Um, I'm speaking as a family physician, not on behalf of my academy at this time, but I think I'm representing. Um, same reasons that I also favor what looks like option one from the work group. Um, A, not to eliminate the tried and true 11 to 12 year old vaccine recommendation plus I am somewhat swayed by the argument that perhaps giving this vaccine over so many years has lowered the community carriage of this disease. I also favor making this a definitive routine recommendation rather than shared clinical decision-making for a lot of the reasons Dr. Middleman outlined, but it is a cleaner approach. It is easier speaking for clinicians in practice. It's an it's less, uh, uh, I, I feel like it makes for better discussions with patients who might be hesitant. Otherwise, they just receive their vaccine as recommended. And then as far as the pentavalent, I don't know personally about the financial um, cost savings of holding that in our clinics versus um, two products, but always it's desirable to reduce the number of vaccine vials in our refrigerators. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. O'Leary? Yeah, thank you. Um, representing American Academy of Pediatrics, um, we are not as far along in our deliberations uh, as the prior two speakers. Um, but what I would say is, is I, I think there are a few data points that would be helpful. Um, one, you know, I, I don't know that cost effectiveness analyses are going to be as helpful in these deliberations as in some others, given the current epidemiology. But I, I would appreciate modeling that looks at uh, cases averted, deaths averted, based on the different scenarios. Um, the you know whether it's you know if if you look at the current epidemiology, for example. Um, you know, it seems like these these you know options three or or four are the ones that are sort of going where the disease is. Um, but uh, you know, I understand the concerns around the potential impact that vaccination at eleven to twelve has had, be it disease averted or uh, carriage. Um, the other uh, um, uh, data I think would, that would be helpful is looking at of adolescent visits. So, you know, one of the concerns with, or one of the reasons to do it at the younger ages is, is the adolescents tend to come into the office more, but those, those visits have changed over the years in terms of how often people do seek well childcare, do, do go in for, you know, sports physicals or whatever. So it would be helpful to see the, the, the visits and, and how often these adolescents in the older age groups actually come into the office because I think that would help inform the decision making as well. Because if we see, for example, that visits in those ages are, you know, a third or half of what they are at the younger ages, that may be very helpful in saying, well, this is really going to present some some equity issues here in terms of who can get vaccinated because they're not coming in. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Um, before we take any more comments from liaisons, I do want to go back to. Um, the ACIP members and see if there's additional thoughts or questions that any of them want to make. Dr. Long. I think these are very difficult decisions. Um, we're loath to take away vaccine recommendation. Loath. When was the last time? 
but the epidemiology of meningococcal disease has done nothing but go down since any of these recommendations were made. And I don't think it's as clear as maybe, maybe there are new data that I do not know um, that suggests that the vaccine program has had anything to do with the epidemiology. The, the epidemiology of this disease, I think, is more behavior associated and I may be related to smoking and the epidemiology of decreasing cases to what we've done in this country about cessation of smoking in public places. And also, it irritates the mucous membranes. There was a wonderful article from Atlanta here of bar patronage and a meningococcal disease. And in the military, getting together, smoke, and the next one, alcohol, that your cilia apparently don't just beat in one direction when you're under the influence of alcohol, but they get a little bit wavy. So maybe you don't, uh, you, maybe you don't uh, protect yourself quite as well. I, I don't know any of those things for sure. I am concerned, however, that this idea that college is the deal, I think college gets the risk that gets you the problem but that's not limited to college students. And I worry about the data of who the non-college students are. And if they are inner city, overcrowded, smoking, alcohol using youth, I would be really surprised if they have a lower risk of meningococcal disease. So I'm a kind of against the risk-based but I also don't think the epidemiology of the disease um, suggests that we should continue to give a dose at 11 to 12 years of age. We haven't seen the cost effectiveness models, and I don't think it should just be ICERs over what we currently do. I think it should be cost effectiveness back to the basics because I don't think that would support vaccination for meningococcal disease, at least as many as these. And the very short protection from meningococcal B vaccine, I think is potentially not worth the uh, squeeze. So I, I, I don't know, meningococcal disease, we can't really treat it when it occurs, these patients. It's about the only disease I have to say to a parent, someone who comes in with meningococcemia, say that the next 12 hours, there's probably not going to, I can't show, tell you that because your child is alive now, they'll be alive in 12 hours because all of the cytokine response is what meningococcemia is, and you're only going to make that worse for a few hours. So it's one of those few that we do not have treatments that really alter greatly the mortality once the disease is fully expressed. So it's very difficult because the disease is so terrible, but it doesn't follow the usual rules of vaccination programs and protection of the public because it is so, such an uncommon disease now. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Long. Um, do other ACAP members have comments they wish to make? Dr. Brooks. Yeah, thank you, Sis. One quick comment. In terms of looking at the data for uh, ACWY, I mean, the incidence at, the 11, at age 11, 12 is, is very, very low. And the incidence per 100,000, you know, 0.02, which is probably 0.002 per million. I mean, it's just the incidence is, is so, well, 0 0.002, 0 0.2 per million. I mean, that's, that's so low. Uh, and, you know, you see maybe 50 deaths a year or something like that. I mean, it, it's extremely low. So I'm comfortable with removing the 11 to 12-year-old altogether uh, and changing the schedule. It, it's just removing a vaccine. So instead of three, you get two at that particular age, as opposed to making it confusing, like a different age, give it a 14 or, you know, 10. Um, and then serogroup B, you look at the graph and... It's basically the same, but you do have a higher rate among college students, though, appreciating what uh, Dr. Long is saying, it might be behavioral as opposed to college. So for me, I would, I would have no dose at age 11, 12, and I would probably harmonize at six, age 16 
uh, number one. Give it, a, give it 16 and then give Meninge B 16 and then 7 to 18 with no risk-based, you know, just recommended period. Yeah, so that should be number five. That'd be number five, Dr. Yeah, Long says. Proposer but. number five. Okay, we're going to take three last comments. Dr. Cotton. What? Oh. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I would favor option one. I think it's hard to tell whether the numbers are low in the 11 to 12 years of age, whether that's due from um, the vaccination program that we've already had in place, but do favor moving that second dose of men beat uh, towards uh, closer since the, since it only lasts for about one to two years, so moving that closer to when they're gonna be in college and uh, when they're gonna be at uh, highest risk. Um, also, I think uh, we could leave it as a risk base, but I think that's hard, and it's also hard for equity. You're asking questions about who's planning on going to college, and that can sometimes change, and the behavior is also very um, high in that, uh, um, in that age group. So I think I would favor option one out of those presented. Okay, so Dr. Cotton, Commander Grimes, and then Dr. Lair can have the last word. And I apologize to the liaison representatives to have their hands up. I think we're not gonna have time to take any more comments after that. Thank you. I would also favor option one, um, especially in the setting of the highest number of cases since 2014. Understandably, it is in a very young age group, but nonetheless, I, I don't think now is the time to reduce vaccination of a, for a severe disease in a population that overall has done well with vaccination. Um, and that's all I'll say for now for time. And I agree with many of the comments highlighted by Dr. Sineas. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm reading this right, because I'm used to looking at the immunization schedule to kind of lay out when the vaccines are given. So regardless, on uh, the third recommendation here, uh, there is going to be a meningococcal vaccine that has a routine uh, administration vaccination recommendation. Is that correct? So number three, there's going to be one dose of ACWI, and that would be routinely or universally recommended at 16 years of age. Okay. Um, and then and then the MIN-B recommendations would be risk-based at 16 years for the first dose and 17 through 18 for the second dose. Okay, understood. I, I just asked that question because uh, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, one of the criteria for coverage is a routine administration recommendation, and so I wanted to make sure that wasn't sort of being pulled away, so thank you. So, uh, Commander Grimes, in this context, would a risk-based recommendation meet that requirement for a routinely recommended vaccine? We use the word routine to mean like three different things. So, would this be considered routine if it's risk-based and be so, eligible for inclusion in the program? So, so at the current time, the, the excise tax language says any meningococcal vaccine. So the men B vaccines would continue to be covered, but if the full category had a, a routine administration recommendation pulled off, I, I'm not sure that's ever happened before. So uh, I'd have to update you at the next ACIP meeting. So it seems like any of these options would, would, would be fine from the perspective of the program and coverage. Yes, ma'am. So I'm um, wearing my chair hat. I'd like to thank everyone's opinion for giving us your opinions, and I appreciate that, and we'll take it back to the work group. Taking off my chair hat, and as an ACIP member, I did want to give my personal opinion, so very clear this is separate from my chair hat. Um, I will never vote for a routine recommendation for MEMB. The cost effectiveness is too high, and the duration is too short. So that's just my personal opinion. Um, and I'm very comfortable removing the 11 to 12 year old vaccination recommendation, although I hear many different opinions. So again, thank you very much for your opinions. And I think we can move on to the next presentation. Can we go to slide 53, please? I will now discuss the term of reference for the GSK pentavalent men ABCWY vaccine. Next slide. There are two new men ABCWY vaccines, one manufactured by Pfizer and one by GSK. The Pfizer vaccine, Penbrea, 
is licensed and ACIP voted on its use at its October 2023 meeting. The GSK vaccine is currently in clinical trials. Each vaccine is a combination of an existing MEN ACWY vaccine and an existing MEN B vaccine. The meningococcal vaccines workgroup has previously assessed the Pfizer vaccine and will assess the GSK vaccine separately in the coming months. Note that there are a lack of data directly comparing these two vaccines. Next slide. For the Pfizer vaccine, the ACWY component is Nemenrix and the B component is Tremenba. For the GSK vaccine, the ACWY component is Menveo and the B component is Bexero. Both vaccines are intended to be administered as two doses separated by six months and are indicated or anticipated to be indicated for 10 through 25 year olds. The clinical trial participants included both men ACWY primed and naive subjects and men B naive subjects. Longer interval studies are planned for both vaccines. Note that the Pfizer pentavalent vaccine does not provide protection against gonorrhea, while the GSK pentavalent vaccine provides some protection against gonorrhea. Next slide. The policy questions for GSK's pentavalent vaccine mirror those previously used for the Pfizer vaccine and are depicted here and are, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for men ACWY, men B vaccination in people currently recommended to receive both vaccines at the same visit, for example, 16 year olds? Should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive men ACWY only, for example, 11 through 12 year olds? Should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive men B only, for example, during a serogroup B outbreak? Next slide. For the Pfizer pentavalent vaccine, the work group rated the top six outcomes as listed here, meningococcal disease, short-term immunity, and serious adverse events were deemed critical, while persistent immunity, interference with other vaccines, and non-serious adverse events were deemed important. Gonorrhea prevention has been added as an outcome for the GSK pentavalent vaccine and has been ranked as important by the work group. We do not anticipate data on gonorrhea prevention from clinical trials, but we will assess this outcome using other available evidence. Next slide. The next three slides depict the PICO questions, which again mirror those previously used for the Pfizer vaccine. I, as a result, I will not spend much time on these three slides. This is the first PICO question. Next slide. And this is the second PICO question. Next slide. And lastly, this is the third PICO question. Next slide. That concludes this presentation. I would now like to open this presentation up for questions and discussion. Dr. Lear, did, Dr. Cotton. Oh, okay. Um, I think, I think what Dr. Shalik presented was quite straightforward, but there may be some of you have questions or comments, so um, we'd welcome those now. Um, so seeing no, no request to speak, I think we can take this as uh, that the committee's fine with the terms of references presented. Um, I, it probably didn't hurt that, they, that this is very similar to what has been done before. So thank you very much. That was excellent. And um, so I think um, unless, uh, unless Dr. Lehrer or Dr. Shilley have additional comments, I think we can conclude this session. Um, we can, uh, so we'll now, um, now break until um, 1245. So we will, we'll have uh, just about half an hour and, um,
Uh, we'll see you back at 1245. Thank you very much.